Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I am joined by George Stocker. George, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Could you let everyone know a little bit about who you are and what you do to give some context for what we're going to talk about today? Yeah, as Jonathan said at the top, I'm George Stocker. I've been a software developer for about 18 years now. Um, prior to being a software developer, I was in the Army. And then I got out, started doing software development professionally, and have since then been in both large corporations, small corporations, startups, um, B2B SaaS, everything across the spectrum with all types of team sizes. And then a few years ago, I had the opportunity uh, to go independent and I took it. And since then, I've been doing uh, subcontracting while still trying to uh, niche down and actually create my own business where I don't have to trade time for money. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. And can you tell folks a little bit more about your any specialties or what sorts of things you've done inside of software development? Yeah. So uh, I focus primarily on .NET through my career, which is the Microsoft stack uh, akin to Java. And I have worked in a lot of different uh, programming stacks, but that's the one that I've worked longest in. And the most type of work that I've done uh, is leg legacy modernization, uh, where large enterprises and medium-sized enterprises have uh, .NET applications that have um, gotten long in the tooth. Mm -hmm. And their choices that they face are either rewrite or find some way to make use of this .NET application uh, in the brand new world we have where cloud is a thing. Uh, and so uh, much of my work is architectural in nature, uh, helping teams figure out how to split up their monoliths, uh, helping teams figure out uh, what to rewrite and what not to rewrite and how to use uh, something that's made so much money for their business over the years uh, without trying to pour heavy costs of a big bang rewrite into mm -hmm. it. Mm hmm. Oh, I've seen so many times I've seen. Well, let's let's yeah. And rather than me talk about my experience, <laughs> what has your experience been when people do do a big rewrite? Yeah. So as someone who has made this mistake myself, uh, thinking that I could possibly rewrite an application in less of a time than it took to write it initially. Um, the biggest mistake is that people thinking that, hey, if we just rewrite this thing, we will solve all the problems we used to have. We won't have any new problems and it will take half the time it took us in the first place, none of which are true. Um, so people run into uh, long slogs where they're, you know, they've committed to the rewrites. They've sunk cost fallacy of saying, I have to rewrite. And then once they get into that, then they realize, oh, crap, this old system that's still making us money has a lot of ins and outs and what have you's that we didn't know about. Um, and now they're stuck in a place where. You know, they feel committed to finishing the rewrite, but at the same time, um, they're, they're not seeing uh, stakeholders, they're not seeing the value from a rewrite that they were pitched by their architects and by their development teams. So these projects end up getting canceled, uh, people get fired, um, and then the business is still stuck with this old monolith that it's increasingly finding a hard time to maintain, uh, and it still needs to make money and evolve in an ever-changing uh, business landscape. And so it, it just, the problem compounds upon itself. Um, now through sheer force of will, sometimes the rewrites work, but it typically is sheer force of will. Right. And you just end up with new problems. <laughs> yes. And the, the, the circle starts again. Yeah. And you get one of my, uh, I, I can't even, there's so many stories popping in my mind. I have never heard of one of these things going well ever, ever. No, and no yeah. Um, Joel Spolsky uh, in the early 2000s wrote things you should never do part one. And he references the Mozilla, uh, excuse me, the Netscape rewrite that shouldn't have happened from four to six and how that tanked Netscape. But that, you know, while um, while that's a famous example, we're seeing, you know, hundreds and thousands of little examples pop up every day. Um, and the, the problem, like uh, one of the projects that I was part of that failed that got me into, OK, you know, now we need to actually like focus on how to do this right, uh, is that when businesses make a bet they don't realize that um, how long the investment is for or how short the investment is for. And what I mean by that is saying, hey, I would like to use you know, fancy new technology. Well, fancy new technology is either going to have a lot of warts that you don't know about or uh, it's going to work and then you have to deal with those warts. If it fails, you still have to like, deal with the fact that the business landscape is changing around you. Uh, for instance, the introduction of cloud and that people the software developers you have underneath you that are working on this thing, they don't have, um, they don't necessarily want to stay in the old world forever. You know, they want to increase and grow their careers. 
So there's a lot of forces that are pushing and pulling uh, that make a rewrite both a, attractive uh, and deadly. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the that's the main thing that I've seen is that, that the, the developers who are usually, they're usually advocating really hard for a rewrite because they don't want to become a dinosaur and they're sick of the old code base. It's really frustrating. They want to work on shiny new cool stuff like they see all the cool kids doing. And so there's all of these all of these non-business related motivations for the developers to be advocating for it. And then the business maybe is convinced, but you know, it's really, it's really naive, really naive. Uh, again, I, I don't think I've ever seen one of these things go well. So, all right. So this isn't really a show about how to, <laughs> how to do it or that it's a bad thing. I mean, it, it, you know, that's not the point. The point is how does someone how do you connect with someone who needs you in this situation so that you can help them avoid what is almost surely going to be a tragic situation? So, yeah, yeah so that's the main question for today. It's kind of a positioning thing, but it's also, it's, I think even more, it's going to feel more exploratory than that. It's not just like, hey, let's, let's come up with some positioning statements and see which ones seem like they would work hypothetically. Um, so, so let's talk about, there's a bunch of different ways to tackle this kind of a thing. Uh, the one that I like to start with, if possible, is the who. So if the problem is, well, let's articulate the problem. Uh, and this would this is sort of the underlying problem. Uh, and I would sort of summarize what we've been talking about as, you know, there, there's, there's a consideration on the table to do a Big Bang rewrite. And there's this, there's a push and pull, there's some some desire uh, to do it and some fear about doing it. So that's kind of the situation. Uh, is is that really the problem though? Or is the problem that, like, why is it a problem at all? Why not just stay on the monolith? Yeah, so what the business is seeing uh, is they're seeing longer time to get features out. They're mm -hmm. seeing uh, more outages and more regression bugs. Um, and they're seeing increased maintenance costs that is that their team is spending a lot of time putting out fires in their system uh instead of delivering you know what hopefully gives gives the business its competitive advantage okay so and a ceo or uh, somebody in leadership inside of a company depending on how big the company is maybe it's a department head or something or an svp or what it doesn't matter but it's somebody in charge of a big budget and they've got this software that is like you said earlier getting long in the tooth it's got all these problems there's just regression error all these things and i should point out there's one other aspect to this that you also see this and that's also when a business has commissioned an mvp typically from an offshore team mm -hmm. um and it doesn't have to be offshore it's just any situation where the people who are building the software their values are not aligned with the people buying the software mm -hmm. and so they build something quickly the business uses it when they're small they see traction with it this is great by the time they realize that there are so many hidden traps in this thing, it's too late. They've built right. their whole business off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now they're trying to scale, which is where I've, I've currently trying to position myself on that side of things. They're trying to scale and realizing this can't do it. And they're seeing outages, they're mm -hmm. seeing regression bugs, and they're losing sales because of it. Okay. I would categorize these as, um, it, this is interesting because it's very, you're basically using the same skill set, but I would, I would characterize these as to almost unrelated types of symptoms or underlying diseases. So the mindset, unless I'm mistaking you, but like if somebody's if somebody's trying to scale an MVP without doing the legwork of properly architecting and so forth, that feels like a very different scenario um, than than like we've got this giant monolithic thing that that we just we need to do something about because it's causing business problems is that am i misunderstanding how big the mvp is or do you agree that those are different scenarios those are different scenarios but because of their impact on the business uh in the latter case if we've just got a big monolith you know we've got to do something about it you can limp along you can you can duct tape it in the case of an mvp the problem they're running to is more acute and more urgent that is, we have to scale either because our um, VCs want us to, or our private equity equity group, or whoever, or bootstrapped. Like we need to make more money, 
um, and this isn't doing it. So they're seeing it from a, not from just a cost savings and not just from a maintenance perspective, but they're seeing it from an acute, we actually need more money to come in the door perspective. Mm. Okay. So whenever I hear the word more acute, <laughs> I get, I, I lean toward that, you know, like limping along, uh, doesn't sound great. Like if, if the, if the business can limp along and like maintain the status quo, in a sales meeting with someone like that, I'd be like, go ahead. I, I don't want to get involved with something unless you're, you're, it, it, you know, they're, you're feeling like severe pain because I know what a mess these things are. It's not a small problem to it's, it's a major undertaking to deal with any of these things, uh, in a sort of monolithic scenario. And if they're comfortable limping along, I'd be like, Shh, there's no value here. You know, like, um, the, the example I use is, um, is underfunding public education in the US. Like almost anybody is gonna say like, yeah, p teachers aren't paid enough, or yeah, teachers shouldn't have to be buying paper for their kids or whatever. And a lot of people will agree with that as suboptimal, let's say, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a problem, but the symptom, it affects everybody differently and nobody owns it. So like whose, whose problem is it and what symptoms does that problem how, how do those, how does that problem present itself in different people? Cause it's going to present differently. That same root cause is going to present differently to the students, to the parents of the students, to the teachers, to the administrators in the school, to the uh, city officials, to all the way up the food chain to like federal officials, everybody's going to have a different symptom from that same problem. So with something like something like a big monolithic system that is capable of limping, limping along and they can kind of just throw more devs at it. Then unless I was talking to the CEO or someone way, way up the organization who had, who had autonomy and a lot of budget and had what I believe to be a major, um, major, I don't want to say the word problem, like a major symptom that was just, they were like, look, this is going to be the, like, the existential level system, uh, problem. So like, they're, they're like, this will be the, we're losing customers. Amazon's coming into the space. We're in a race for our lives. Uh, we, if we don't do something about this, we're probably gone. Now my ears are perked up, but if I'm talking to somebody in a sales interview in the sort of legacy monolith model, that's just like, eh, you know, we, this isn't an existential crisis. I'm like, I'd rather not touch it <laughs> unless I was maybe doing something very small in advisory. So something like that. But anyway, when you, when you, when you, when I imagine those two scenarios, the other one being, you know, somebody has got a private equity firm that's just like, this is our chance. The proof of concept is working. We're destroying the brand because of the fail whale is <laughs> popping up, you know, every day. Then that to me is like, that sounds like a scenario that's a probably much more fixable could be wrong there. That's a big assumption, but probably more fixable. Um, just because the, again, probably because the size of the code base and the cultural situation is going to be way more, everyone's going to want to fix it. Right. Everybody's aligned in the other situation. You have a lot of people with a lot of different agendas and they're not all aligned. A hundred percent. Right. So for the, for the purpose of this conversation, let's drill into this, uh, scaling the MVP angle. What, what kind of companies are we talking about here? In your experience, what kind of companies are we talking about? Is there a vertical that you are, are most familiar with or one where there's really a lot of money at play? You know, I don't know, FinTech, for example, or something, something big. Yeah. So um, I've seen it across a few verticals, but I don't know if B2B SaaS is actually a vertical. That sounds like an entire, <laughs> that sounds like an entire set of verticals. It's a starting place. Yeah. Um, but in B2B SaaS and the other condition that caused this is generally that that misalignment. It's generally that first initial team that built it is not the team that has it now, uh, mm -hmm. generally because they offshored or generally because they got, you know, a consultancy to build them their MVP and, you know, use their initial seed round uh, or pre-seed round on that. And then they're now, now they're uh, in a different situation. So it is, um, it is generally uh, because people who grow organically that bootstrap, they don't have this issue because they can keep up with it. You know, they didn't, they didn't come into the situation late. They were planning for this. Um, but generally VC wise, they're planning for their next round. It's a very different, it's a short-term versus a long-term mindset. And it's those people with that short-term mindset 
um, because they have to, like, they're like, Hey, we're not going to have runway in six months. So it really doesn't matter if this thing, you know, is, is going to fail us at, you know, a hundred thousand users, if we can't even launch it for a hundred users. Um, and so it's there, it's that my, it's that type of, I, I don't know if I'd call it a psychographic, but it's that type of situation, um, that generally makes this occur. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. It, it's, it's definitely not bootstrapped um outsourced mvp so there's a lot of things here that are somewhat outwardly identifiable they're still a little bit inside the company you, you might not know if they outsource the mvp for example but um can we drill in more what are some of the verticals that are most common in b2b yeah so the uh with customers i've or potential customers clients i've been talking to when i've been doing research into this space um i've seen it in uh, the marijuana industry, um, and in, um, the, uh, somewhat with AI, but less so, um, it looks like they, they have a different set of issues around, uh, DevOps, uh, ML DevOps. Um, but I've seen around the marijuana industry, I've seen around B2B SaaS where they're targeting, um, you know, they're going up the verticals. So they, they start targeting small companies. Now they're targeting larger companies, um, and they're, they're finding these issues. Um, regulated space. Uh, so insurance. So in, in insurance, um, because and one of the issues they have is they both have a lot of changing uh, regulations uh, in some verticals. Um, so like in the alcohol and beverage industry, um, but in other verticals like life insurance or health insurance, um, you know, they have to either figure out new plans to offer or local regulations to deal with. And so their change comes from trying to build and maintain a system that can handle those changes um that come just out of the wind out, out of but, a whim yep but are these are these monoliths or are these like insurance doesn't i don't really think or, or even alcohol doesn't feel like new enough is there a lot are there a lot of disruptors in these spaces that are trying to come in with mvps or yeah that's where you're seeing um when private equity makes a move so money goes to where it gets its, gets its greatest return mm -hmm. um you see them saying okay we, we've got some money in the stock market now let's put some money into these companies and grow these companies so in in one situation it would be like internet sales of alcohol mm -hmm. um that's an actual industry that is uh growing and that has a lot of online changes partially due to the pandemic mm -hmm. Um, and so you see that in that space, um, of course, marijuana, uh, I don't know that space as well, but I, as I was talking to some customers in that space, they've, they've also had, uh, those issues. And that's primarily because, um, you know, the industry itself is growing, um, because it's being, um, it's being legalized and decriminalized, mm -hmm. uh, legalized in some States decriminalized in others. And that's causing that industry to grow. So they're, they're starting to see those pains. So give me a sense of. Uh, can you give me an example to just kind of instantiate it for me? Like what's a B2B SaaS look like in the marijuana industry? So like, like yeah. Um, so you can deal with, uh, they're dealing with different parts of the supply chain, um, but they're also, so they could be direct between um, the, the growers and distributors, but it could also be between um, like an online marketplace for, you know, so in certain States you can, you can buy it in an online marketplace or, you have uh, this software handles the point of sale for those local uh, marijuana shops. So it handles the logistics and the um, POS management in those shops. Okay. So we're kind of talking like SAP for weed, Square for weed, and uh, Shopify for weed. Basically. Yeah. Okay. And, and there are, there are, and you're telling me that, that people don't use Square and Shopify and, and SAP, they have, or NetSuite, maybe they are using some some stuff that's specific to their industry, or that, or certainly there are companies that are trying to be the NetSuite of weed. Exactly because of uh, social and legal issues uh, and financial issues. Mm -hmm. If you say say to your bank, "Oh, by the way, yeah, we sell weed," mm -hmm. um, that could have a different impact on you and on your business and on anybody that does business with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because stigma or stigma and just regulations, okay. um, you know, bank, banks do not like risk mm -hmm. <laughs> and telling the federal government, yeah, we have clients that, uh, that buy and sell weed, mm. um, that could be an issue. And so you end up having basically things that stay inside of states 
So you have an, an industry growing inside of California that doesn't doesn't you know doesn't leave the state because if it does, now you've got federal problems. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's what you you know that's what you wouldn't see in other types of verticals. Um, and insurance, it's mostly dealing with um, ever changing regulations and trying to handle the increasing complexity of doing insurance, uh, whether it's property or life or health. And you're telling me that in the insurance space, there's there are like disruptors that are out there selling an MVP. They are they are trying to scale their MVP, or they have a or in another case, they have a long standing. Uh, system that worked when things were a lot simpler, but things are no longer simple. Oh, so um, I'm ignoring those people now, though. So those yeah. those are the monolith people, right? Right. Yeah. And I, I use monolith as a uh, as a term for basically also means legacy, also means uh, not built to take advantage of modern affordances like the cloud. Um, it's not cloud native, so it ends up being a catch all for you know everything that isn't that. Right. Yep, I get I get that. So I'm trying and when I saw insurance, I was like, uh, it feels like we're oozing into legacy. If, but yeah. if, there, if there are, you know, if there are, are disruptors that have or even it could be it could be a air quotes legacy company that did get, I don't know, maybe it's internally funded or whatever, but they got they, they created a brand new thing and it's not based on their their old way, you know, something they built in, in the 80s with COBOL. It's a new thing. You know, like, uh, you know, like if I don't know if Intuit made fresh books as like a as like a, a side bet, you know what I mean? So does that does that is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Or like, are there legacy companies that are in this that are trying to disrupt themselves, basically? Not as much. Um, it's more of, you know, smaller players um, with the legacy companies. They're not so much trying to disrupt themselves as they had that other problem that we're ignoring now. You know, they're they're trying to react to the fact that they can't, they can no longer, their system no longer does what it needs to for them. So they're having the other issue that isn't as um, acute. Okay, so yeah, it's in my mind, I'm visualizing like uh, the the legacy people are trying to turn the Queen Mary, and these other people are trying to pack more people onto a a jet ski. So very very different. Okay, so let's stick with the jet ski people. Continue to stick with the jet ski people. Um, so I'm kind of crossing off insurance there, unless you can, unless you tell me that there is uh, that there are a bunch of like there's a lot of activity in this space. A surprisingly number of people on my email list uh, hail from an insurance background, which I did not expect. But um, they're the jet ski people, or are they the Queen Mary people? They're the Queen Mary people. Okay, so forget about them. Yeah. So if we if we're talking jet ski, there's tons of that in fintech. I know that's I happen yeah. to know that that's true. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. And give me one more. So we've got uh, we've got jet ski people are are marijuana industry fintech. Give me one more. Um, would you all do uh, alcohol and beverage sales or no? Uh, if there are disruptors, you know, if there's jet ski people there. Yeah. Um, doesn't seem like there would be, but no, I... they're, they're again, when I talk to potential clients, I've talked to clients in this space, um, who've had these issues. Um, but it was not, it was not very many. So it's a, it could be a sample size problem, uh, or it could just be, there aren't very many people that are dealing with that in this space. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's see, uh, the other one, um, as I said before, uh, people in the uh, machine learning space that's uh, in the AI space, those are spaces that are both uh, growing. Um, and typically, though, they're not using when they are using .NET, they're using it because that's what they knew before. Mm -hmm. So they're not using it because, oh, gosh, you know, .NET's the best for AI. No, they're using it because I know uh, .NET and I want to do this new AI thing. Um, so let me use you know, uh, ML.NET and let me use that and let me grow a business off that. Okay, but um, what business? What businesses are the most obvious? Because that's just a tool, right? So I don't have a good answer for that um, because I'm, I'm. It's one of those spaces that I'm not in, and so I just see the the effects of the space. So I just see people flocking to it, not necessarily uh, what their business is behind flocking to it. Exactly. Okay. So um, fintech. What's another one? What about remote work? Be, like sort of B2B remote work, like Zoom and other collaboration tools. Have you, has that been something you've 
not not people across. I've talked to. Uh, like for instance, the people I've talked to in my list or in my my social networks, uh, mainly Twitter. Uh, not that I've seen in those. Um, there is one that is uh, B to C home um, delivery uh, in that space. So more of those are propping up. Yeah, the things that center around how to get uh, things to the house um, that consumers want. Um, so is that so? If you had a bunch of leads, let's say. And one of them was B to C instead of B to B. Would you be like, mm, I don't know, or would you be like, Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no, I'd be like, Yeah, that's fine. Um, the problem doesn't change. Maybe the scale uh, at, at which we have to fix it changes. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got five million people using your system, it's a lot different than five thousand. Right. Um, but the problem itself doesn't change. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, I, I feel like we've identified three hypothetically. The hypothesis is that there are at least three, probably a lot more of these um, jet ski type people who are, you know, I don't know, trying to pull a tugboat with a jet ski, however you want to <laughs> use the metaphor. Um, who tell me, tell me more about what the ideal company size is like, give me a sense of the, the company that, that would be your client that's got this MVP. Is it a... 10 person firm, a hundred person firm, a thousand person firm. Like what's the, you know, it, it, and just to give some context there, it, generally I have found that when a company gets big enough, they don't need, they don't always need an outside consultant because they have, they can hire that person as a FTE full-time employee. Uh, but and when they're too small, maybe they don't have enough budget to afford your exorbitant rates. <laughs> You're right. So there's like a sweet spot where the company's pretty big and there's a, you know, it's, it would, I would think that these particular kinds, they're going to have a revenue stream. So it's not like there's just pie in the sky. We're trying to make an MVP and see if anything sticks. You know, these people have something to lose and they see not only something to lose, but they see a, a window of opportunity that's probably closing. And so they're going to be in a big rush. Uh, but so what's the, what in your experience is the best size for you, uh, in terms of, let's say headcount, it could be, could be other ways that you could measure it, but let's just say headcount. Yeah. Tech team would be under, um, definitely under 50, probably under 25, uh, company size, definitely under 500, most likely under 250, um, or just getting close to that. So probably, you know, between, between 24 between 50 and I would say between two, 50 and 250 on the company size and the tech team, the people responsible both for operations and development uh, would have to be under probably between uh, probably between 10 and 50 at the outside. Once you start getting above that, you've, you've got all of, as you said, you've got all of the institutional knowledge that you need to solve this problem on your own generally. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if we, if we picked, if we just ran, well, okay. So let's, do, do you personally have any problem working in the marijuana space or would you prefer, if you had to pick between weed, FinTech and home delivery, what would be, who, who would you rather hang around with? Yeah. So I'd rather not hang around with FinTech um, because they're not my kind of people, but the marijuana people aren't, are also, um, they're cooler. Um, but there are social stigmas around that. Um, so fintech, you know, from a business perspective, it would make most sense and least stigmatizing to go with someone like fintech. Um, but when you say make the most sense, what do you mean? Uh, in that it's the most socially acceptable. Um, it is going to have a lot of growth, uh, in the space. Um, I thought you said first you wouldn't want that one. Well, I mean, from like a, gosh, do I want to hang out with finance folks all day? Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, that's one of the three industries that's, that's growing here. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interesting I would be more... that you're, <laughs> I find that fascinating that you're, that it sounds like you're considering when you say social stigma, you mean that you care about personally, uh, like you don't want to tell. That I care about because people in my, uh, people with my background to care about it. So let's say none of this worked out I, and I had to go find a job again. I live in the Northern Virginia area, right outside mm -hmm. of DC. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of government uh, and government centered jobs out here. 
And mm-hmm. if this didn't work out, I went back to them and said, hey, I'd like to get my clearance back and mm-hmm. work in them. They're like, you worked in the marijuana space. And I'm like, yes, I did. And that would be <laughs> an instant no. Okay. Um, and so that's why like, I don't have any personal issues with it. But if I, as a fallback, if all of this failed, then it would be difficult for me to get a job in this area uh, in, the, in, in or around the government space, which is most of the jobs in this area. Mm, got it. Okay. Uh, well, what about home delivery then? If you don't really f- care for finance people, uh, let's let's go with finance people. But home delivery would definitely be uh, an option. Okay, uh, right. And you know, and I think I, I would guess I don't. This is probably n- a huge ex- another huge assumption, but I would guess that there's going to be a difference between jet ski fintech people or finance people and Queen Mary finance people. Uh, could be wrong. Um, but I would imagine that they're going to be a little bit more creative and entrepreneurial and less status quo y and buttoned up, but who knows? Um, okay, so if we were gonna if we were going to look for And that's true too. Um, you know, I when I when I think of in, fintech, I do think of the large uh, Queen Mary types. Um and so yeah. I, I could just have a uh, a misperception of the startups in this space. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be pretty cool to work at Square or Venmo even. I mean, Venmo is PayPal, but, you know, one of these one of these whippersnappers it's, it could be cool. I don't know. I, I yeah. really don't know. But I do have other students that do serve fintech, and there are just thousands, thousands of these upstarts that are getting funded. Just yeah. so, so many of them. Yeah, so Stripe would be fun. Square would be fun. Venmo, you know, PayPal would be okay. Um, so yeah, those are, those are okay companies. It's the, I guess it's the larger ones that I'm, uh, maybe have a different perception of. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Stripe, there's so many, I think there, it could be cool. Anyway, could be cool. So, so that you're not doomed to a life of white button down shirts. Um, okay. So if you were going to look for fintechs that had 50 to 250 employees, with a tech team between 10 and 50 people that that they've already had that that had a seed round or something like that where would you look uh the linkedin sales navigator (laughs) yes you're that is right (laughs) that is the first place i would look uh i recently bought a subscription to it and uh it's wonderful for finding Mm -hmm. these sorts of things and that's Mm -hmm. how i got in touch with all of uh, my my potential clients when i was first trying to niche down like b2b SaaS cto's Mm -hmm. i found them all through that and it's Mm -hmm. wonderful Mm -hmm. okay and is it the CTO that you would talk to about this stuff or would it be the CEO, do you think? I don't know enough to know if the CEO would see the issue. I know the CTO would see the issue, but might lack agency to fix it uh, or, or lack the, you know, the budget to fix it if they're not, you know, if they're not on the board. Uh, and in some cases they are, in some cases they, they aren't. And then they have to uh, go to the board and try to get them to spend this money. Oh, well, let's let's explore that a little bit because I'm, uh, it's a slightly surprising for me to hear that, but I'm sure you can clarify. So, so what? Tell me more about the the problem that a jet ski company would have at this particular point in time. Yeah, they would be um, typically, as I've seen, they would be trying to uh, scale up, and they would be having outages, if, depending on the type of company outages on their big sales days. Um, or having, you know, they are not able to uh, go after new markets uh, as quickly as um, the CEO would like. So the CEO is saying, hey, you know, we need to be in this new market in three months. And the CTO is like, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Why? Uh, just, cause of, just because of um, load? Uh, load, uh, definitely. Um, decisions made in the past uh, under different sets of circumstances by the development team. Um, Can you make that concrete? Sure. So uh, they've decided that they're going to, you know, store all their data uh, in SQL Server, which is great, but they're going to use triggers to handle auditing and updates. And then when you get to a certain point uh, of complexity or of size, uh, the triggers start to make your database fall over. Now that is that is it's another space that uh, someone like Brent Ozar goes in with SQL Server performance. But if you want to get out of it, there are other ways uh, where you don't have to you know, actually try to deal with the database part, you can actually do it in other ways. And those, those other ways are where I come in. 
Okay, so you, they can't expand to new markets, n not because that you know somebody hard coded the Virginia regulations into the into the code base, and they now they can't easily expand to West Virginia or something. So it's not that it's it's a, the like load. Yeah, and it can be the former, but it it typically isn't. It's typically something load oriented. Um, yeah, or something that hey, we we got to this, uh, we get this size, and we're seeing memory pressure that we would otherwise wouldn't see, and we don't know how to fix that. Um, yeah, and also uh, from the monolithic point of view, if they're still operating as a monolith, they don't have the ability to horizontally scale. Don't confuse yourself. Forget about monolith. Stick to jet ski. So like, that's that's like I know it's difficult, but for this exercise, like that's that's the thing. Like let's niche down and find exactly what the problems are. Yeah. Well, the, so when I use monolith, I don't necessarily mean something large. I mean something that is a single deployable that can't be horizontally scaled. Fair enough. Okay. So the horizontal scaling is a particular problem. They business well. They 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 see that as a solution. I want to horizontally scale. I can't with the situ with the current status of my system. It does not horizontally scale, but I want to, um, and that's one issue they see. Okay. So you're just talking about the architecture of the. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, yeah, I was conflating that with legacy. Okay, so um, what are some other what are what are some other things that the CEO doesn't want to hear from the CTO? C CEO says make this happen, and the CTO says sorry. So can't uh, they're having outages on big days? I gu I'm guaranteed the CEO knows about that. Yes, and doesn't like it. Can't expand into larger markets. Guaranteed the CEO knows about that because he's probably he or she is surely the person that wants it and is getting a no. What other things would a, a CEO request that they just get a, not, not, not the reason why it's a no, but what are other things that they would get a no? Um, it could be uh, the CEO saying, I want to move to the cloud. Um, and just because, you know, that's a, that's a buzzword. Uh, and the CTO could be saying, no, we can't do that. Um, that would be one other thing. And that's, that goes along with the horizontal scaling. Usually no one wants to move to the cloud because they want to move to the cloud. They want to move to the cloud to get rid of uh, their data centers um, and they want to move to the cloud so they can horizontally scale their application because that's easier than trying to vertically scale an application. Mm, okay. That sounds a little bit like a solution masquerading as a problem, but okay, yeah. I'll take it. Um, all right. It's basically a load thing. Yes. Okay. So in some way, shape or form, it does not perform the way it needs to at a critical time. Okay. Uh, is there is there much in the way of there's probably not much in the way that the those older like the legacy ones that have you know regression errors and stuff like that I feel like there probably would be less of that but to, but you tell me like is the CEO are, are there never mind the out the load based outages mm -hmm. are there like a lot of bugs in production are there embarrassing show stopping bugs or like lots of I don't know, like a really bad UX or other brand damaging complaints that these people are likely to be getting. Yeah, all of those things because they're trying to move so fast um, and their system can't does not allow them to move that fast. Uh, and so you end up having regression bugs. You end up having showstoppers. You end up having you know, late night deployments and redeployments, um, you know, on call issues um, where the you know the tier three support has to be. Um, you know, on call because um, we're having these things happen at two o'clock in the morning regularly when we batch update. Um, and so they end up getting pulled into those, which ends up, you know, increasing uh, turnover uh, and stress on the development team. So when you say they're trying, so, so is it, if I was going to put that another way, are you saying that they're basically duct taping things on to this thing that just fundamentally can't support what they're trying to do. And that creates a lot of bug. Like you said, they're trying to move fast. Yeah. So they, the, the impact you see is that we want to add new features. So we're, you know, we feel pressure to add new features, even though we know in our hearts, uh, we've actually got to re-architect this thing. Um, but we're feeling pressure to add new features. So we're going to add them at the speed the business wants, which ends up compounding, uh, the problem. And so they end up seeing, you know, the impact, the impact is you see these regressions, you see these showstopper bugs, you see these severity uh, one incidents um, more how, and more. And what, how would those be communicated to the CEO? So CEO gets a message from the, someone on the board or a VC or some VIP 
and it's like, hey, your sites, there's what? There's what? There's a uh... your site's five hundreding, let's say, um, or you know, we're not seeing new products on your site, or um, you know, hey, I can't, we can't place orders. Oh, okay, there, there, there you go. Your supplier's calling. We can't place orders. Suppliers call. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. So maybe the site's not down. Right. It's just having lots of pro lots of uh, issues where the people that need to place orders or the people that need to get updates from your system or the people that want to use your system are running into problems. Okay. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get real crispy on what the problems are. How, what would the supplier say? <clears throat> your site Your site's not letting me place orders. Um, like they would it would be whatever their you know whatever goal they're trying to accomplish. Um, right, but give me one. Can, uh, give me a more specific one. Like, can you think of a time that this happened in your in your history? Like, is there a story that you can remember? Yes. So the um, in one case, the uh, it was a big it was the giant sales day um, for this industry, and um, on April twentieth, and their uh, site could not handle the load. Uh, of people coming to try to you know buy from their marketplace of uh, of weed, yeah, and so April like 20th. they, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they were running into um, the system was going up and down. Um, there were actual um, delays in database rights, and just the entire it was a very stressful time, and it kept it kept happening. Um, and so they would you know they they did not. Um, know the system as well because it was an outsourced MVP uh, that they were trying to grow. And so they did not have the institutional knowledge to be able to dive in and be like, ah, here's how I fix this. Uh, and it ended up hitting them year after year. Year after year. Year after year. And they've they've and they've been they've been trying to uh they might have finally did it. Um, but last my conversation was they've been trying to get off of and just rewrite because they feel like that's easier than trying to, you know, have the expertise and get the expertise and figure out the problem with the system. But it, they're now running into all the problems of a rewrite. Mm. God. Okay. Just taking some notes here. All right. So I think I, I was hoping for a, a couple of, um, couple of other maybe secondary or tertiary symptoms that the CEO would be suffering from, but it's really, it's really load. It's outages. If, if that's one of the problems, it's the biggest one. <laughs> like, yeah. So, and there's all different ways that it, it could be, um, all different ways that it could be cause like big sales day or just trying to expand into a larger market or whatever the whatever the reasons are more people are trying to get on the jet ski it's gonna sink it just keeps sinking so you know putting a you know whatever some new horn on it like some new feature on it isn't going to change the fact that we can't handle more people right so this is what are some of the other other than the site being down obviously what are what are the things that, or let me ask it in the, the dumbest possible way. Why is it bad that there are outages on big sales days? Yeah, they're losing money uh, and, they're, uh, and they're investors. So they're losing money from two ends, right? Their investors are losing confidence in them mm -hmm. uh, and they can't make sales that they need to make to stay alive. Mm -hmm. um, those, are the two, those are the two ends they're getting hit from. Uh, okay, investors losing confidence, business losing money. What about their customers? Yeah, so the the customers are the ones that are you know seeing these these poor reputation for you know, for years. I mean, we still know what the word fail well means from Twitter. Yeah, right? so <laughs> they haven't had one in years, and we still know what it is. Yeah, so they're losing brand reputation um, with their customers. Yep, and with especially with B two B, that's real bad. Right. All right. So CEO is your buyer here. I mean, like it's not the CTO. I mean, if you it, it could be the CTO, but why not go for the CEO? If you've got problems that a CEO knows about, outages on big sales days, you know, and, and what does that cause? That causes you to straight up lose out on money. It causes your investors to lose confidence in you. It causes brand damage and destroys your reputation. Like those are all CEO things. And they're really bad for somebody who's trying to build a business like this. So this is, I mean, for this kind of, uh, you know, scale up MVP disruptor, Kind of company 
I mean, that that's super crispy. I mean, that is like, yeah, if someone's feeling those pains and they believe that there's someone to talk to about that. So what, let's flip it around. What do they wish? What would yeah. be like, if you could wave a magic wand CEO, what would, what would things be like? Yeah, there would, they would, they would be able to, uh, you know, handle any, uh, any customer, you know, coming to their site, they would not lose a single, uh, dollar in a sale. Um, you know, they would not lose face with their investors, right? Investors would be blown away, right? Investors would be like, here's more money. Exactly. Okay. Anything about, uh, we didn't say anything about competitors in the pain section. Uh, would there be, is there anything else that the, um, anything that's a little bit more specific, maybe less of a big deal, but more specific. So let's say, is there something in fintech where there's a regulate regulatory body or um, auditors or something that's because because we could say these things about any space where there's a SaaS involved. Is there something specific to fintech that is unique that would be part of the pain or part of the dream? Like maybe it's some sort of you know failure. Maybe they're required to have some kind of audit trail, and like when the database rights were screwed up, they they had to redo them by hand, or or they were just lost, and there was a big fine. Or is there anything specific to them? No, that's exact. That's exactly what they see. Um, they have to keep an audit trail. Um, they have to um, be able to say this is where this came from, and this is how this happened. Uh, there are regulatory, um, lots of regulatory bodies in the financial space. Uh, and there's also uh, compliance as you get larger, uh, like SOC, that you have to you know, actually you know, try to architect your system so that it, it complies um, so that you can sell to larger or that you can be as a, you know, in the B2B sense, that you can be a supplier or be a part of the chain for larger companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, so when you say compliance, it's government compliance, but it's required by certain companies in order to, for you to be selected. Is that, is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's exactly right. Okay. And what, it, what are the, what's the biggest regulation or I don't know how to say it. Like, what's the biggest thing that, you know, like what's the HIPAA for this space? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, SOC and SOC 2. Um, so it's, um, they contain these audits that basically says, you know, your, your system and your, your, um, corporation complies with, you know, the SOC 2 uh, audit standard. Okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And that's, you know, system and organizational controls is what SOC stands for. Is it, is it SOC? SOC, yeah. And it covers security, availability, um, how they process data, uh, confidentiality, and um, of course, you know, data breaches. So customer privacy. Mm, okay. And how, how would you, would you say, you know, whatever your software is out of SOC 2 compliance or something, or you're, they would be you trying fear... to get, yeah, they would be trying to get into that space. So they would be trying to make their systems, uh, SOC 2 compliant. So it's generally, you know, it's one of those things where they, it, it's, uh, not a psychographic, but it's a transition point for a company where we went from, we didn't need it to now we're trying to sell to bigger companies. Now we need it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Great, great, great. All right, cool. So, um, and we've got a great crispy, we've got first, we've got a ideal buyer, CEO of this kind of company. I won't re reiterate again. Um, the, some, some really expensive pains, some really attractive dreams. So what are, what are, is a fix? So like, if we imagine that you've got most people, when they're, you know, a consultant or a freelancer or developer or whatever, they, they start out doing custom projects. So let's just say that, uh, in a perfect world, if you had lots of resources, you know, the, the client was basically gives you a blank check. Um, how would you run an engagement to remediate these outages? Yeah. Um, so it'd be first, it would uh, try to figure out what part of the system is actually causing the problem. So it'd start um, with an audit of some kind. That's right. So uh, an assessment, basically go through, uh, run the system, you know, see where um, there's some scripts you can run, uh, run the system, profile the system and say, okay, where are we actually having our biggest issues? Um, and I should actually back up. That's the first technical thing that you do. The first non-technical thing you do uh, is to actually talk to 
um, both, you know, the people that uh, are responsible for building and maintaining the system and people that maybe use the system or what the purpose of the system is so that you can get an understanding of, you know, what is the invariant? How does the system supposed to operate? You know, what input comes in and what things do we deliver? So what is a customer asking for versus here's what I give them and here's the, all the steps that my system has to go through to make that happen. Um, and then it's diving into, you know, how does the system actually work? What is it doing right now? And that gives you a sense of the pieces involved. And the reason why I want to know what pieces are involved uh, is that in some cases, fixing the system is, you know, breaking it up. So back to the word monolith, right? Mm -hmm. by, by default, all software is monolith, monolithic. Um, we're just now starting to develop um, cloud native and what we call microservices. Um, and so part, you know, a solution may be let's break the system up into the discrete pieces uh, and then have those pieces be decoupled from each other so that we can horizontally scale the pieces that need to scale. And so that we can keep the changes away from the parts of the system that need not change. Because when it's a monolith, it, it's all going to change. Um, and if you break the system up, then you're able to control what changes happen to what part of the system. And you're also able to decouple the system so that uh, you can scale the parts that you need to scale. Um, and that may mean involving or implementing something called an event-driven architecture, uh, which is a different way of thinking about how little services communicate with each other. Yeah, let's not get into let's not get that yeah. deep yet. So, but that's where the that's where the solution would tend to head uh, in my space. Mm -hmm. okay. In my so, space, <laughs> <laughs> dating ourselves. Um, okay, so so number one, I would call it stakeholder interviews. Yes, and then you do uh, an auditing procedure. Yes, and then you would architect a solution. Yes, I would. I would try to give. I try to give three possible solutions. So what is the stopgap thing we can do right now mm -hmm. uh, as one? Uh, what is the, all right, if we want to get the stopgap and we want to not have to revisit this in the long term. So if you don't just want to band-aid, if you actually want to fix the problem, mm -hmm. here's what we would do. And then the third one is, um, you know, whatever, it doesn't fit in the other two buckets. Um, so it may mean, um, you know, let's re-architect the system. It may also mean, no, let's just, you know, focus on this particular piece. So if it's the database, let's focus all of our energy on, you know, re-architecting re this part of it so that that doesn't happen again, mm -hmm. but that could take time. So you want that stopgap. Hey, if we, if we could do something that would only take, you know, less than a month, what could we do? Um, but that can be a stopgap or it can be part of the long-term solution. So you want to separate it out in case uh, it's, you know, in case it goes against a long-term solution. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you would have found out from stakeholder interviews, things like how much runway do you have? How fast does this have to happen? What, you know, all the, all these business details, correct? Right. All of those contexts that we don't tend to think about as developers, but that are important. So the financial context, the business context, the cultural context, what will the team and what will the business actually let you change? Right. Um, and then the, of course, the technical context, if I didn't already say that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so once you've come up with these sort of like, uh, you know, good, better, best, or like near term, long term, or and maybe something in between, once you come up with these options, these different architectural options, you would presumably present that to leadership, and and if, and then they would make some kind of determination based on your recommendations and the feelings of the other stakeholders, like what the best um, plan would be. I guess yeah, yeah, plan. Right. What's their appetite for change? Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that point, at that point, somebody has got to do it. And so there's like, uh, so what, what would you do next? Or what, you know, again, if they've got a blank check, you like them, they like you, what would happen after the architecture is, is selected and approved? Yeah. So I give them the option of, um, you know, Hey, I can, uh, you can just keep me on call and I can help you through this. Um, like an advisory retainer, or I can go further and say, Hey, I can actually exercise technical oversight of this so that I will make sure that it stays, you know, whoever you hire, uh, I will make sure it stays on the rails. I will make sure that it doesn't go against, you know, the architecture of what we're actually trying to achieve. I'll make sure we don't fall in any holes or along the way. Um, because typically if the team could do this, they would have already done this and they wouldn't need me. So by the fact that they're doing this for the first time, uh, means that they don't quite know what they're doing yet with this. 
And then the third one uh, would be, hey, I can actually uh, do this for you. So, you know, I can um, interface between you and a team that I hire to do this um, and we can you know, work together to get it done. Um, because typically time is the concern. Um, they don't want to they don't want to spend a year. They don't want to spend six months. I mean, they probably spend six months, but they don't want to. <laughs> so anything they can get, you know, sooner uh, is better. And usually they're at this point, they're willing to throw money at it. But that goes back to the architectural problem, because if you've got an old team and a new team working, uh, you know, one's trying to split it out and the other team's trying to add features to it. You've Oof. got a lot that you've got to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why, you know, in that conversation of giving them the three approaches initially, short, medium term, you know, where you said good, better, and best, um, it's a conversation about, okay, all right, you want, you know, do you really want to re-architect this thing? And you want someone else, another team to do it next to your team? Because that's got its own issues. Right. Um, so. Okay. So, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit in the coaching slack and it all aligns with, uh, I think the, the product, I mean, in a sense, you're describing a product ladder. Um, you know, you've got, you, you could sell the sort of diagnostic recommendations thing onto itself, the kind of audit that will actually remind me because we've so many people talking to in there, um, <laughs> around similar things. What stuff are you currently selling? Like, what do you, what do you have, uh, on your website that you right. currently offer? I offer right now uh, the assessment or the the roadmap, uh, mm -hmm. the architectural roadmap, and then I or, and I offer the advisory retainer. And I don't say I offer custom projects, but I offer custom projects. Right, like if you find the right thing, and they're like, "Oh, we really yeah. would like it." Yeah. So cool, smart. All right, and it feels to me the thing that's different from for me from this conversation than from previous uh, in Slack is that it feels like. Um, just personally for me, I have way more clarity on the distinction between these two, what I've been calling the Queen Mary and the jet ski kinds of clients, where before I, I feel like previous conversations in my mind, it was less clear about who the, who the client might be. And it was more, you know, we've had conversations in the past about like, you know, worldview type stuff and like things should be architected this way in general, or, you know, so on and so forth, and like more horizontal. This is this is a lot less horizontal. This feels a lot less horizontal than before. I don't know. Is that true for you too, or does this this is all like is this all like obvious to you? And and, and it's really me that's kind of getting the clarity. No, it's it was not obvious to me at all because from my perspective, I didn't see a difference between the old and stodgy that had a monolith that they were trying to you know increase the longevity of versus the young upstart. Um, that decided that, hey, we, we actually have an acute problem here. Um, to me, they were the same because the solution is the same. So the solution is the same, right? Right. And that, that was the problem I was saying. So this has been very helpful into, hey, um, you know, it used to be, I would say, I help B2B SaaSes scale up their .NET monolith, or I help .NET uh, teams, you know, move to microservices or event-driven architecture. That's what I used to say. But now I can actually go in and say, hey, fintech, yeah. you know, FinTech CEO, right? Exactly. Are you having these issues? If so, uh, I can help and then less on what I do right. and how I do it and more on solving the problems that they have. So this has been really useful oh, good. Uh, in, in that regard. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like when you started talking about event driven architecture, I was like waving my hands like, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, that'll I'm going happen. going to sleep now. Right. That, and that conversation is it's super important, but that's after the sale. That conversation is after the sale, or it might even be when you are doing the stakeholder interviews and, and uh, trying to come up with something that's feasible for the constraints that this particular company has. Like I could imagine, I could imagine a situation where you're like, wow, this company is not going to be able to handle it. They don't have enough time or budget or something. There could be some constraints where the best practices can't be applied in their situation. So you have to do something really smart. That's where a consultant can come in and say like, yeah, all the advice you're going to get online is, is, is like X and it's not wrong, but it won't work for you because of reasons one, two, and three. So we need to come up with something clever and improvise and do something that's going to keep the ship afloat or the jet ski afloat to torture the metaphor. No, oh, yeah. So yeah, great, great, great. Okay. So I'm glad to hear. Yeah. That's exactly why I reached out because 
um, you know, going two levels down into how I do it doesn't matter. And what I've been doing in the past and how I've solved these problems in the past has varied. Um, it's not always been adopt X. Um, it's been, you know, whatever works for the context for the situation. And that's why I felt like I was floundering with my current positioning because mm -hmm. my current positioning was focused on what I do and how I do it, which I wouldn't do all the time. And, but then it leads to people that only want when they have that particular, you know, they already think they, that's a solution, um, that they approach you. And, but that's not what I want. I want the problem to be where people approach me. I'm, you know, a FinTech company having outages or running into, you know, acute regulatory problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and I work and I you know, happen to have a .NET system. Um, can you help now? Right. The question becomes, should, if I'm talking to the CEO, should the tech stack, should I even mention that part? Hey, when, you, when you when you just said .NET, I was shaking my head. <laughs> I was like, it doesn't it it. Well, you tell me, does it matter? I mean, I would be personally a little bit reluctant to take like uh, you know a shop that's essentially using Linux for everything. You know, there's sort of Apache open source hippie people like me. <laughs> I would be reluctant to like, okay, we're going to move everything over to Microsoft and, and be like, oh, yeah. Well, .NET is also, Microsoft is now getting hippie too. Like they run on Linux, they have .NET Core. Um, so they're, you know, in the past few years have been expanding into that space and actually making it so .NET wasn't Windows only. Um, and that's great. Uh, that's, but that's a very new, relatively new development in the life of .NET. There's only been the past three or four years where that's been a thing. Mm. It, that's fair. That, and that's cool. And I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but still, they're not going to have, if they don't have any .NET talent on staff, that could potentially be a constraint and just be like, oh. So yeah. the question is, if they were, I don't know, if it was a Python shop, I don't even know, like if it was something else, would you be able to help? Yes, because I, and I only say yes, because I have, there are, there's always architectural things, whether or not the implementation is different. There's always architectural things that you can do, and those are pretty consistent among stacks. But I also have Python experience. I have, you know, JavaScript systems experience, Python systems experience. Mm. Um, but that's the only reason I could say yes to that. Uh, if I didn't, if I didn't understand the intricacies of Python, um, I would not be able to help them solve those problems. Right. Um, so. so I. So here's here's my thought. Like I would probably really min. I would s really minimize any mention of of .NET if you're because if you're reaching out to to CEOs and you're getting traction um, and it's just turning out that all of them are I, like name something that you would say no to. Like, I can't help you with that. Like, I don't know, COBOL or, or yeah, I can't help you with that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if somebody came along and was just like, I would probably just deal with it at the stage. I would deal with it conversationally mm. and just be like, um, you know, if let's just say, you know, you changed your, your LinkedIn headline, to uh, hey fintech CEO, are you you know struggling with SOC two compliance, or or are you having outages on your biggest sales days, or whatever, whatever, whatever it ends up being, or I help fintech CEOs scale, or whatever, whatever the the thing is, and let's just say you find you find something that starts to get people reaching out to you, you know, you start to have conversations. I would probably just handle the the stack in the conversations. And I wouldn't anywhere near lead with it. And if they said something like COBOL or whatever, you know, I would still politely help them to the extent that I could in the phone call and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not f really familiar with COBOL. I wouldn't be comfortable, but maybe I could, you know, put you in touch with someone or maybe, you know, and maybe over time there are some, some, you know, you end up with a little black book of people you can refer work to if it's just not going to be a good fit for you because of the tech stack. But I, I think if you're operating at a level like this is a very high level strategic architectural level, the implementation details shouldn't matter. They will start to matter more and more as time goes on with the project. So like the longer you engage, the more they're going to matter, but to do like, um, to do some of these things like uh, an assessment or, you know, some of that stuff, probably, Oh, well, you tell me it might not matter what stack it's on or, or there you just, are attracting lots of .NET people by accident, you know, and you can just not even worry about it. Yeah. So it goes back to what we said before. They're they're all going to have the similar patterns of issues in the implementations. The implementations might, you know, the fix might be different, or um, the problem might manifest itself in an implementation in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they are all going to have the problems. Yep. So if you were doing pro, let's say you're just doing project oversight. 
or let's say you do the, a turnkey implementation and you bring in a Cracker Jack COBOL team and it's your job to, to, to really do have the highest level of involvement at keeping the, the train on the tracks. Like, would that be within your, would you be comfortable with that? Or would you think that would be a mistake? Um, I wouldn't know. Yeah, I think that would be a mistake only because I wouldn't know how to source. I mean, there's probably so few COBOL people left that they're, the ones that are still doing it are the, are the rock stars. Mm. Um, but my issue is if it's not in a stack I've worked before, I wouldn't know how to source the people okay. um, to solve the problem. That that's That's the difficulty. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So there's a boundary line there. Yeah. And that's fine. But I, I wouldn't uh I wouldn't even bother leading I would certainly not lead with it. I might not even bother mentioning it. Maybe down in your bio it's like, you know, I'm you know, hi, I'm George. I've been a dot net expert or whatever you want to say in your bio. And maybe it's mentioned somewhere, like not saying hide it, but uh yeah. I think I think to optimize for conversations and and uh, just focus way, way down on the ideal buyer, which we've defined clearly here and figure out how to get on their radar in a way, you know, so that when they, uh, either when they eventually do have an outage or they're having current, let, let's say they're not currently having outages, at least they'll be like positioned. You'll be positioned in their mind as the guy to call when the MVP starts falling over, you know, or maybe they know someone that is in that situation. And so you can meet them at the right time. You know, so, I mean, if we back up, the whole point of position is to make you memorable so that when the time comes, yours, yours is the name that pops into their head. So, uh, yeah. So if you were aligned with, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know what we would call it exactly, <laughs> but I feel like it's, it's clearly defined. It just needs to be clearly articulated in a way that's perhaps a little snappy or catchy or memorable, but, but very clear, you know, so. Yeah. And, and to reiterate, that's the problem that I'm having currently is that I'm not able to trigger a Rolodex moment while I help .NET team scale their tech. That's, that's just so broad to, to not, you know, oh, am I, well, can he solve this problem? Can he solve that problem? But focusing and you and you helping me focus on a vertical uh, allows me to say the problem in the way the vertical would encounter it uh, and not in a, you know, not in a vague, wishy-washy scale their tech way, but an actual problem they have. Um, and so I would rather have more conversations and conversations that I could say no to than my current state, which is having very few conversations <laughs> Yeah, because it's a lot of, you know, there, there's so many layers to get through before we can figure out whether we should have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Cool. We could probably talk all day. We should, should probably wrap up. Um, where can people go to, uh, put you in touch with FinTech CEOs who are having outages <laughs> or ask you more questions or make suggestions or, uh, let you know that they're a rockstar cobalt developer that you could hire. Yeah. So my website is creatively called georgestocker.com, which is also my name, uh, <laughs> S T O C K E R. And you can find me on there and how to contact me in any way you'd like. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on George. Thank you for having me. All right, that's it for this time. I'm Jonathan Stark, and you have been listening to Ditching Hourly. Bye. Hey, Jonathan again. Do you have questions about how to improve your business? Things like value pricing your work instead of billing for your time, or positioning yourself as the go-to person in your space, or maybe productizing your services so you never have to have another awkward sales call or spend hours writing another custom proposal. Book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me and get answers to these questions and others in the time it takes you to get ready for work in the morning. Best of all, you're covered by my 100% satisfaction guarantee. If at the end of the call, you don't feel like it was worth it, just say the word and I'll refund your purchase in full. To book your one-on-one -on -one coaching call, go to jonathanstark.com slash call, C-A-L-L. That URL again is jonathanstark.com slash call. Hope to see you there.